So as I say over and over again, when I have the opportunity to be in uh, the presence of you all, it's, it's great to see you. It's great to see you in the numbers that I see you presenting yourself in today. That's encouraging as well. Um, I don't really want to go through any protocol with respect to Crown Forum. You know what it is. We've had conversations, deep conversations, over the last several days. Certainly, you've re received some correspondence from me. Um, Crown Forum is something that's special, right? Crown Forum is an evolution of chapel. You hear us say over and over again. And that's not just said in a rhetorical sense. It's said in a sense such that we uh, give respect to those individuals who care to come in to share their thoughts, ideas, perspectives, um, and influences with, with us. So we want to make sure that we take care of not only the individuals who are in conversation with us, but we want to make sure that we take care of ourselves and hold this ritual that is dear to Morehouse College as, um, as sacred, right? And again, that's not in a rhetorical sense, but in, 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 a, sincere, in a sincere sense, all right? So without further ado, go ahead and close those doors. Go ahead and close the doors. So without further ado, we'll have um, the commencement of today's program with, uh, with our opening prayer. Then uh, Mr. Micah Holmes will introduce our speaker for the day, who is uh, Dr. Chris Jones. Good morning. May we all assume a posture of prayer? Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou whom has brought us thus far along the way. Gracious creator, we come to say thank you. Thank you for your grace that lifts us above all of our problems. Your mercy that forgives our faults your peace that surpasses all understanding. We pause now to lift your name and offer praise for you have done exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think. When we fail, you lift us. When we failed, you redeemed us. When we were tired, you gave us rest. When we were stressed, you gave us peace. And God, we ask that you would look upon us and do it again. Give us peace again, give us joy again, give us love again, give us grace again. Give us mercy again, and we will continue to listen for your voice and do your will. Now, God, bless the days ahead. Give us strength to run the race and do what has never been done. And after we've done all that you've assigned our hands and hearts to do, we will be careful and quick to give you all the glory. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. Thou changest not. Thou compassions fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Gentlemen, if you're coming in, please proceed to the front. Fill up as many seats in the front as possible. All right. So how we proceed going forward is that we will have our formal address and our conversation with Mr. Jones. After this, we will sing the college hymn, and Dr. Jones will stay to be in conversation with those who want to be in conversation. So again, good morning, men of Morehouse. We got. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we gather today for our beloved Crown Forum amongst the Morehouse community in love and in search of wisdom. Our guest today comes bearing many prestigious titles, including nuclear engineer, executive director, ordained minister, PhD, and the list goes on. But in all things, Dr. Jones is and continues to be a prime example of what a Morehouse man looks like and what a man of Morehouse can be. As a husband, father, and child of God, Mr. Jones has lived life with a strong sense of faith, balancing his love of science with his passion for impacting communities around the world. 
This faith has led Mr. Jones to return home in a new light and introduce a new light to a place that has been amazing to him, having the courage, dedication to run for governor to ensure every person in Arkansas has the opportunity to succeed. Today, we are greeted by the once man of Morehouse, who is now running for governor in the beloved state of Arkansas. And he is excited to share his wisdom with each and every one of you amongst his congregation. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Chris M. Jones. Good morning. To me, there's never been a conflict between science and faith. I'm a physicist. I'm also an ordained minister. Those are the opening lines to the launch video that became the most viral campaign video in this election cycle. It was my introduction to the broader world. Now, I stand before you as the first African-American nominee for governor in Arkansas. One step closer to becoming the first African-American governor of the great state of Arkansas. It's an honor to be back on these hollow grounds. Yes, I sat in the seats you're sitting in. I walked the halls you're walking. And so to be here is truly, truly humbling. And I wanna start by thanking the good Dean, Dr. Lawrence Carter. He and those who lead with him have been instrumental in my life. Uh, and thank you for giving me time. Uh, if, if you all are anything like I was at your age, there are 20 other things that you could be doing and 100 other things that are on your mind. So thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be in your space and to have your attention for just a brief moment. Brief moment. I also want to thank my lovely, amazing wife who's here today, Stand up, Dr. Jones. As you can see, she is beautiful. Watch it. Hey, don't, no. I'm from Pine Bluff. Don't let the degree fool you. Dr. Jones was raised in Alabama. Uh, she is a graduate of Howard University. It's too soon. We're gonna leave that alone. She's also a graduate of Harvard Medical School where she uh, is now an ER doc. She's a captain, she's a former captain of the Air Force, having served in Afghanistan. She's the state medical director for disaster preparedness. She was working the finish line during the Boston Marathon bombing. She teaches an exercise class. She's the mom of three girls and she puts up with this Morehouse man. So give her a round of applause, please. Science and faith, these two concepts are seemingly in conflict, but in fact, they're in concert with each other. My understanding of how connected they are was fundamentally shaped here at Morehouse. It was professors and mentors like Dr. Rockward, Dr. Bach, and Dr. Martin, who were not shy about their faith, and help, help me see the connections between the two more clearly. Biblical scripture tells me in Hebrews 11 that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. When I read that, it strikes me that there are things that are seen and things that are unseen. When I put my physics hat on, and I am a physics major, Shout out to all physics and math majors in the room. Somebody give a clap, because I know we got some. There you go. 
When I put my physics hat on, I see it from a different angle. There is matter that we see in the world and in the universe. And then there is matter that we cannot see. They call this unseen matter and energy dark matter. Dark matter and energy make up 95% of the universe. And we can't see it. We can only see 5% of the universe. Only 5% is visible. So I want to talk to you for just a brief minute about the matter of faith. The matter of faith. Say it with me. The matter of faith. One more time. The matter of faith. Now, what if Hebrews 11.1 was really astrophysics in words? What if our recent understanding of dark matter and energy was just us seeing things more clearly? Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is two parts, two components, two aspects. Part one is the substance of things hoped for. Substance is tangible. Substance is real. Substance is seen. We hope for things we see. What if the visible and seen universe was actually what it's talking about? What if that is the 5%? What if that is the visible matter of faith? The second part or component of faith that is outlined in Hebrews is that faith is the evidence of things not seen, meaning it's there. You know it's there, but you only know it's there because of some evidence that actually you can't see. What if it's the 95% dark matter and energy that astrophysics explains? What if dark matter matter is the things not seen? We only know dark matter exists because of its influence on something else, not because of dark matter itself. Imagine if I punched you in the eye and then you went back to the dorm. Your friends would see the evidence of my fist, but they would not have seen my fist. That is dark matter. What if dark matter is the invisible matter of faith? Whether we realize it or not, we are influenced by the matter of faith. The 5% visible matter of faith and the 95% invisible matter of faith. My family has lived in Arkansas for over 200 years. We were there well before Arkansas was a state. And if you do the math, yes, that is before the Civil War. They were enslaved. I carry with me a pouch that has four things in it. And one of the four things is a copy of the census record from before 1867. And on it, my ancestors are an age and a dash. And I often wonder, what visible matter of faith did they have? What could they see that caused them to press on? I wonder if they even saw the 5%. I question how they learned to, how they leaned on the 95% invisible matter of faith because they had to lean on faith to press through. My grandfather, Pawpaw Jesse Tarns, had a third grade education and he drove a truck. His third grade education was enough for him to know that education mattered. It was his 5%. He saw all around him those who were benefiting from the education they received, and he knew it had to be valuable. That was his 95% invisible matter of faith. I would often sit in, his, in the truck bed of his 18-wheeler, and if you've seen an 18-wheeler, it has a bed inside for folks to sleep when they're taking a break. And I remember him telling me, big man, get an education, because when you get it in your head, no one can take it out. He knew that education was critical. 
not because he had seen it personally, but because he had seen the impact that education had on others. He wanted it for his grandson. My life is filled with the invisible and the visible matter of faith. I grew up in a very modest family. We were what I call the struggling middle class. I spent a lot of time riding dirt bikes, eating honeysuckle, and fighting grasshoppers. And when I was growing up, I had patches in my clothes. But we never lacked love. And a pivotal year in my life was when I was eight years old. In that year, I began to see and understand, even without realizing it, that there was a 95% invisible matter of faith that was at work. And in that year, some very special things happened. First off, I heard and began to realize what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was saying. Now, I grew up in a town called Pine Bluff, and there's an HBCU there, the University of Arkansas, at Pine Bluff. So I knew I was going to a black college for college. I just didn't know where until I heard our fellow alum, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and his words inspired me, and so at eight, I said, you know what, I want to go to Morehouse. And also at eight, I happened, it happened to be the year of the Challenger accident, the Challenger space shuttle from NASA. That year, they had what was called the teacher in space, and Krista McAuliffe was on the, the spaceship. And also on there was Ron McNair, and as I watched and learned about their journey throughout that year and set in the room as a third grader and witnessed the space shuttle lift off and explode. For me, it was a moment to lean in, to say, how can I be a part of a future that fixes the problems and begins to get us back towards space? And I was inspired by Dr. Ron McNair. And I said, you know what? I want to go to MIT and I want to become an astronaut. And also at eight, my father, who sold insurance, took me in his car, and I think it was a Volkswagen Beetle, because I remember that in that Beetle, in the floor bed, it was so old and worn down that there was a hole in it, and you could see right through to the ground. And he took me from my hometown of Pine Bluff to the big city of Little Rock, about 45 minutes away, and we were in the mall, and there we bumped into none other than then Governor Bill Clinton. I was fascinated by this guy because he stopped, he paused, he talked to me, he engaged with me, he saw me. And so afterwards I said, Dad, what does he do? And my dad said, he's a governor. I'm eight, I didn't know. I said, what's a governor? And he said, go look it up. So unlike you all, we didn't have cell phones or the internet or Google. So we had to go home and open up something called the Encyclopedia Britannica which I know you all have not heard of. Now, we didn't have the whole set, but we happened to have G. And I pulled out G, and I began to look at what a governor could do. And I found out that a governor could solve problems and serve people and make a difference in their lives. So at eight, I said, you know what? One day I want to come home and serve as governor. That was a pivotal year because in that year, I began to understand a little bit better the 95% invisible matter of faith that my dreams would be built on. Now, what I did was I held on to those dreams. And when it came time to apply to college, I only applied to Morehouse. I'm not suggesting that you all tell anyone to do that, but I did it. And folks told me and they looked around and they said, hey, you should apply to other schools. But for me, it was a matter of faith. And we didn't have a lot of money and my folks couldn't, I already had two of my siblings in college they were paying for. And so the question was, how are we going to pay for this? And I got a call. The 95% invisible matter of faith was at work. And the, the, the favorite call I got was when the McNair Scholars Program called and they said, hey, would you be interested in a full scholarship to Morehouse College? And the only requirement is that you work at NASA. That was the invisible matter of faith at work. And so of course I came and my time at Morehouse was transformative. 
I sat in the seats you sit in. I walked the halls you walk. My freshman year dorm was Graves Hall, and I, I've seen one of my Graves Hall, there you go. Come on now. I see you. One of my classmates who was also my dorm mate is here, and I'm, I'm thankful for him, Dr. Brock Myers. Y'all know who he is. Is that Joe Carlos? Watch out now. And so my life was transformed in this space. And the bonds we formed, I formed with the Brock Myers of the world and the Joe Carloses and the Ron Falls of the world. We were iron sharpening iron in the hallways of Morehouse College. And we formed an unbreakable bond that we still hold today together as Morehouse men. And when I got to Morehouse, I knew I wanted to major in physics but I decided to also get a math degree. People thought I was crazy, and most folks told me I couldn't do it in four years, which is the time I had, or else I would not have a scholarship after that. I didn't know how to make it happen, but I found a recent graduate of physics and math, and we sat down and mapped out a plan, and the plan wasn't easy, but it was the 5% visible matter of faith that I could hold on to. Then I decided to do the insane. Something told me to run for student government president. Now I have to admit, it was crazy, because I was already a double major. And that semester turned out to be one of my worst academic semesters of my career. I ended with a 1.9 GPA that semester. Right. Don't do that. Don't do that. But I learned so much. Uh, and even failing in those classes, and even not performing the way I could, taught me so much about the visible matter of faith and the invisible matter of faith. And running and serving as student government president also transformed my life because I did win. And while SGA president, we did so much so much. And in fact, I'm going to ask you all, who's looking forward to homecoming? You excited about homecoming? Well, let me tell you, you may be excited about homecoming, and I'll just say you're welcome. Because we did something to transform the way homecomings were done. Morehouse used to do homecomings on its own before our year. And we thought it'd be far more impactful to join with other schools in the AUC, with Spelman and Clark and Morris Brown. We had the first joint AUC homecoming festivities that year, the first in history. Then it was epic. And it was the beginning of what you see now and the precursor to Spelman and Morehouse actually joining and becoming Spellhouse. And depending on what you think of that, you can thank me or blame me. All the while, though, my eyes remain locked and laser focused on the next goal. So when it came time to apply to grad school, I only applied to MIT. Now, let's be clear again. I am not suggesting you do that. You have to follow your own path and your own journey, but it was mine, and I was 100% committed to it. And once again, others thought I was crazy, and they thought that something wasn't right. And it turns out, I actually had a conversation with then, the then president of Morehouse College, Dr. Walter Massey. He was a physicist, and he ran the National Science Foundation, and he was the chancellor of the University of California system. And when we were talking, he said, Chris, you're a good kid. I know you have dreams. You need to apply to some other schools. And I looked him in the eye in his office and I said, Dr. Massey, thank you for your mentorship. Thank you for everything you've taught me and given me and, and done for the school. But for me, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. And so 
I had to step up and stand on not only the 5%, but the 95%. And sitting in his office, he shook his head and said, okay. And I'm thankful for God how it turned out. I knew and needed to understand the 5% of visible matter of faith that I could see, and I needed to trust the 95% invisible matter of faith that I could not see. That belief and understanding took me on an outstanding journey through MIT, where I got three more degrees, two masters and a PhD. It took me through teaching high school, through serving as assistant dean at MIT, running a nonprofit, doing management consulting, running the Arkansas Regional Innovation Hub, and now becoming the first African-American Democratic nominee for governor of Arkansas. This doesn't happen without seeing the 5% fully and trusting the 95% fully. To this day, people told me I was crazy to run for governor. But what they don't know is that the foundation that I received right here at Morehouse has prepared me for this moment. Now, as you contemplate understanding the visible 5% matter of faith, and trusting the invisible 5% matter of faith. Know this, there are things you have to do. Understanding the visible requires you to look inward to appreciate what you're made of and look outward to appreciate what's been put on your path. Let me say that again. Understanding the visible 5% requires you to look inward to appreciate what you are made of and look outward to appreciate what's been put in your path. Trusting the invisible 95% requires you to ask questions of things that happen, to seek understanding of what is happening and why it's happening. You won't always get an answer, but over time, patterns will emerge. Let me say this as well. The most critical thing you can do is to be the 95% for others. Be the force for someone else that moves them along even when they can't see you. Be the matter and energy that shapes their journey in a positive way. At the Innovation Hub in Arkansas, we were the 95% for businesses doing work all throughout the state because we pulled together resources that benefited them and gave them the lift. While at Morehouse, we were the 95% for the last Democratic governor of Georgia, Governor Roy Barnes. We organized a march for voting, and in that march, we registered people to vote in the neighborhood and at the school, and, we mar and our march included none other than Maynard Jackson and John Lewis. It made a difference. You can be the 95% for others. And remember, the seeds you plant will become the fruit you eat. The seeds you plant will become the fruit you eat. So plant good seeds in others. Now I want you to do something, pull out your phones. And you're quick to do that, like you're ready. This moment matters. When you pull out your phone, I want you to take a photo of yourself or you with someone else, but capture this moment in whatever way you want to capture it. Go ahead. I know y'all not shy about taking photos of yourself. Come on now. Feel free to take a photo of the room. Look out now. There you go. Now, now let, let, me, let me get my selfie while I'm at it. Hold on, hold on. 
All right, now, I want you to be the 95% for me. Post those on social media. Tag me at Jones for AR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell somebody something I said. And make sure you know that a Morehouse man is out here doing something to change communities, to uplift a state, and to transform our society. Take some time and do that. And if I said something worth repeating, make sure you say that as well. Let me end with the story of the bumblebee. Let me end with the story of the bumblebee that some of you all may know. Since probably the beginning of time, the bumblebee has flown around gardens and flowers and plants, minding its own business. Well, in the 1930s, calculations were made at the University of Gutenberg that seemed to prove that the bumblebee, for it, it is aerodynamically impossible for the bumblebee to fly. Of course, much to the calculation's dismay and disappointment, the bumblebee continued to fly anyway because someone forgot to tell the bumblebee. And some of those bumblebees just ignored what the experts were saying. Imagine what would happen if the bumblebee internalized the perspective of those calculations. Imagine if the bumblebee said, well, let's see, the current data and research show that my body mass and my shape isn't right, so I shouldn't be able to fly, so I'm going to sit down and stop flying. If he internalized what the expert said, and he decided not to fly, it would be a dead bumblebee. Because a bumblebee that doesn't fly is a dead bumblebee. And let me tell you, there are experts who have a lot to say about black men. There are experts who have a lot to say about our trajectories. And the experts will tell us what we can't do. They'll tell us what we shouldn't do. And I'm telling you now, let us be like the bumblebee and ignore the experts and fly anyway. This phenomenon became known as the bumblebee paradox. It even found its way into a well-known children, well children's book, The Bumblebee Flies Anyway. We can't allow the perspectives of others to shape us. When others see only the 5% visible matter of faith, we must remember that there is another 95% invisible matter of faith another 95% dark matter and energy that is lifting us up, that is giving us boost, and that is lighting the pathway. It turns out that almost 70 years later, scientists and engineers discovered something that the bumblebee knew all along. They realized something that was happening that the bumblebee generated extra aerodynamic lift by a vortex traveling along the wings when it flapped. It's amazing. It took scientists 70 years to figure out what the bumblebee knew all along. They finally saw the impact of the 95% invisible matter of faith. If you waited until people figured out how great you are, before you started acting great, you'd be dead. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait to achieve your greatness. We need you to achieve your greatness. Morehouse shapes you to achieve your greatness. At times, Morehouse is your 95%. It might not always make sense. It might not always feel right. But know 
that the 95% invisible matter of faith is working in your favor. It did for me. God bless you all. Give it up one more time for Dr. Jones. One more time for Dr. Jones. Oh, man. So we learned a lot about faith today, right? A lot about faith. For him to only apply to this school to go on to do these amazing things is a testament of faith itself. Us all being in this room at the same time, you all going to Morehouse College at the same time is a testament of faith itself. So think about today. What is going on in your life? What is your next step? If something is giving you trouble with, say, getting an internship, seniors, if you're getting, looking at getting a job, going into that graduate program, and you don't see it yet, just understand the faith. And also, too, while you're here at Morehouse College, think about the seeds you're planting each and every day. What do you see that you're going to plant today? What seed are you going to plant next week that's going to go into a tree that's going to be, you'll see later down the line, two, three, five years? Think about that each and every day and faith to get you through. So again, Dr. Jones will be here again to engage students in conversation after we commence with our hymn. Um, and now let's stand for Dear Old Morehouse. Right over left. Come on now, get it right. Right over left, let's do it. Lights are bright today. Oh, okay. Lights yeah. are brighter today. Yeah, it's much brighter than that. Y'all should get some good pictures in here. True. 